<laughs> no, no, just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this is. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to be allowed to present. So this is work that I um, started with um, Jorgo Georgiades, Johannes Kreb at the European Central Bank, as well as Johannes Brum in Zurich. Um, whilst I was a research assistant at the ECB before starting my graduate program about one and a half years ago. And so this talk is in some sense going to be, I think, very different from what we've seen thus far, and that it's going to be very, it's going to be very macro. I'm not even going to touch sectors very much, so maybe an offense to many people in the room. And, um, and I'm going to try to connect two big phenomena that thus far have not been connected in the literature, at least to my knowledge, not in this way, and that maybe because maybe there is not anything, but we do think that we see something and try to take really a first, try to stimulate a debate and try to take a first approach, a first hit at making this connection also theoretically in, the, in a very reduced form. So the world has seen many, many major developments two of which being, on the one hand, the emergence of large and persistent external imbalances. So we've been hearing a lot about global value chain participation, global value chains, and so this is... But so looking at charts like this, this is something that has um, struck the interest of policymakers and I mean, academics alike in the, in the past years with um, what we observe here. And also in this paper, empirically, we're really going to be concerned with the time from 1995 to 2011, because that's when we're going to have the data, um, with the fanning out of global imbalances. So what we see is that there's more savings on international asset markets, and also that those imbalances seem to be very um, persistent, as well as structural in the sense that we see the U.S. absorbing almost all of it in the world, and um, on, the, on the other hand, we have countries like China, Germany, the oil producers who, who drive a lot of that. And um, so this is going to be one part of the motivation to try to speak to this. And on the other hand, of course, um, the increase in fragmentation and geographic dispersion, the increased um, reallocation of production processes, the fact that most of the trade is now in intermediate goods. So this explosion, so to say, in global value chains. And what we are trying to do is to ask whether there's a connection between those two phenomena. And so starting with global imbalances, why is it that we feel in the first place that this is worthwhile investing? Well, mostly because we feel that there's a lot of room for explanation. So we, there's some patterns that we seem to have a convincing story for, Persist, um, particularly the deficit in the U.S., or more broadly speaking in those papers, the North, and um, sur surpluses in many in industrialized, newly industrialized in uh, economies, in particular China. And um, so the stories that we've been hearing about that are very much about um, institutions, institutional differences, and how those affect either, or those translate into the heterogeneity of, of financial development may translate into asset demand, into a heterogeneity in asset demand, more demand for safe assets or low-risk assets in the South, therefore an accumulation of net foreign assets by China in the U.S., therefore driving these balances, or by the work that Caballero, Fari, and uh, Gorin Shah have been doing recently, arguing that the Chinese, so they tell the story about the trees and saying that the trees being Lucas trees and the Chinese, are, they have a lot of wealth, but they have no trees. <laughs> so they take their wealth to the U.S. where there's a lot of trees. And um, so this being, um, and this we argue, it still works. Um, they mostly or broadly explain a north-south pattern and that these papers really emphasize institutional differences, saying that, a lot, and, and we're not trying to say that these are not good stories, not at all, and, um, but what we're trying to argue is that there's some patterns which, even given this and given a lot of other factors that we know empirically, seem still a little bit um, puzzling and even for, even for China, for that matter. So, and um, the way we started thinking about this was really from a policy perspective. So at the ECB, I was working on reduced from big panel regressions trying to explain current accounts, trying to fit current accounts as good as possible, throwing in many things and factors that we think affect them. And, um, and yet, if you plot the residuals of such, of such um, regressions, what you see is that 
So this plots, and I'm going to be saying more about the framework when I get to it. And this is now for 2007. I picked, I think in the paper we picked 2009, but I didn't want to expose myself too much to the financial crisis and things. So this is really, starting with year 2003, you could basically draw a picture like that, where you see that there's large surplus countries, in particular China, Germany, um, where the residual that remains is almost as big as the current account itself. And, um, and those are, particularly for Germany, but also for Austria or Sweden, the Netherlands, there's not really a reason to think why such institutional differences, for example, should matter. Of course, there's many other factors that, and these models try to account for that, demographic differences, differences in economic development. Um, but this was our starting point, so, so maybe there's some room for improvement. And then we looked at pictures like this, where this draws um, backward participation. And um, this is also a dis disclaimer that we're going to be measuring global value chain participation by backward participation, which are imported intermediates relative to um, gross output. And, we, and this is not doing justice to the vast literature that has emerged, some of the stuff that Rob Johnson in particular and others have done. We're going to be using some of these measures to, for robustness, but um, in the baseline, we're going to be measuring it like this. But So the striking thing in this, or the striking thing in this image, again, there's no causation implied here. It's just that some of these things seem to co-move over time, and also for the United States, which is not a, particularly a surplus country. The, Oh, um, this is um, the current. Sorry, I'm, if you can't. Read. So this is the current account. This is the the blue line, and backward participation, which are imported intermediates, and a similar pic. Um, a gross output, yeah. And a similar picture works for works in some sense. We get a similar motivation for forward participation, which is how much intermediates you export relative to your output, and um, so. This is where we started from. This is what we said. Okay, so maybe maybe there is maybe there is something, and let's let's see what we can can get out of this. So this is where we're going to be starting the talk. It's an empirical relation, and we're going to be going to be we're going to put such measures into precisely those big. So it's a, it's reduced from models that try to arguably account for a lot and. Looking at these pictures, one could potentially come up with many stories that this is just capturing some variation which is, has completely nothing to do um, with, um, so that there's no causation whatsoever. But starting from finding such a relationship that maintain, or that survives in the data, we want to argue or start thinking about how could we um, even start thinking to, about modeling this in the context of really a simple, plain, vanilla, international real business cycle model. And um, so what an avenue that we will take and explore pre in preliminary results quantitatively is um, arguing that integration in global value chains is triggered by, and relatively to the rest of the world, say increases in the efficiency of the usage of foreign inputs. So this would affect your backward participation. If I'm a country, I'm using foreign intermediates in my production, and for there's, there's um, input augmented shocks that particularly drive to which degree I can do this. And, of course, this begs the question, or asks the question, so what are these shocks? Is this not shifting this simply to a, to a different level, the entire debate? And um, we are, we're going to be modeling it in a, in a very reduced form way, but one way to think about this is that we could think about these being into a sectoral shock, so that if we look at the world, this is something that I don't think has been done a lot in general, that, so we don't have a lot of theory for this, but looking at world input-output tables, and we could, there's no reason to draw the line at the country level. We could similarly assume that, that, this, that, there's a, that this is just capturing an entire trade network, and if there are technology shocks and countries are differently connected, then these could act as something that we pick up or that we model as such an input augmenting shocks, where this is really just saying these are foreign intermediates that are being imported. And then higher levels of participation, now for the example of backward participation, then reflect temporary improvements in the competitiveness. So you have this basically cost shock. Um, you're going to be using more of the foreign intermediates. And if we embed that into a dynamic framework where 
a, pre a precautionary savings motive is present, then parts of this additional income that this can generate will be saved. Yes? I'm trying to square this. Um, I think you, ha you haven't talked about sort of re the importance of relative um, GVC participation. Yes. It sounds like the absolute. And right now I'm saying, well, no. if the whole world became more integrated, right. are we running a, compare, uh, you know, a current account surplus with the moon? <laughs> I, I can't. No, no um, work? I should have said this. Um, um, these pictures are all relative to the rest of the world. So all this is measuring for a given country relative to a GDP weighted average of the rest of the world, how much more are you participating? Because that's precisely, um, I mean, yeah, clearly, because the current account is basically a zero-sum game, and if you postulate a linear relationship between something that's zero-sum and something that can grow for everyone, so we're going to make this variable zero-sum zero in our empirics, trying to account for, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Jump in. Uh, I'm sorry for my ignorance. No, no. Should we be concerned about that? I mean, that these imbalances increase or stay the same or decrease? Do we want them to be smaller? Um, I... Well, you know, like, so, so should we be worried about global value chains aggravating this problem? Or? I mean, that's... Um, I see. No, <laughs> no, but um. No, but I. Uh, there's not necessarily a presumption that the current account deficit is bad. Yes, <laughs> and um, and I think we also. This is really a, a positive paper in that we're just trying to, we see a phenomenon and we want to, rationalize it in some sense. So it's really, I don't really have a very good answer, and I have. I also think I don't really have an opinion on it. So the, the temporary aspect of the shock seems pretty crucial. Yes. Right? I mean, I could imagine that we enter GVCs and I now forecast the growth rate of the economy to grow relative to where it was, and I could generate very different theoretical results. So why, why do you want us to think about this as a temporary improvement? As a temporary improvement? Um, no, primarily because, I mean, as you say, if it was... Okay, I'm not sure I understood you, but uh, as, if it was... I mean, if I anticipate, if I mean, this is a good shock, we anticipate the economy was growing at 1% and it's going to be growing faster and faster, right. I would expect these guys to start exactly. borrowing, not exactly. yeah, yeah, that, that's not lending. So. Exactly. We need, we need a channel for why this is just not being consumed more. You know, they're just yes, richer. And, exactly. Exactly. And um, no, but we, so that's what I maybe try to get at. That, so this is also a crucial point of at least, of course, where do these shocks, shocks come from? Why is there any? Because for trade costs, it's not so, it's, probably not very reasonable to believe that these are temporarily shocked, even if you just look at it relative to the rest of the world. But again, I think underlying in this framework, there would be a way, on, or at least to, to build an, a model of international intersectoral trade, where the shocks that we here declare to be GVC shocks are really sectoral productivity shocks. And, if, and those then aggravate and um, through the input-output structure, and, and thereby, and to believe that like, productivity shocks are temporary, that's probably easier than shocks affecting trade costs in the broadest sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the talk will be structured. So I'm going to be talking about the empirical evidence that we that we have. I'm going to introduce the the model, and it's really and do some quantitative exercises, so we're going to calibrate the model and see what seem to be the, the crucial factors in it that can generate this pattern, and yeah, then I'm going to conclude. So, first of all, data source, I think this is also not something that I really need to uh, uh, mention. So we have the World Input Output rate Database to construct our participation measures. Yeah, it's from 1995 to 2011, and sufficient to calculate what we're interested in on a country level. And then, so what are our baseline measures? So backward participation is gross intermediate inputs to gross output. And of course, there has been a lot of literature, and rightfully so, um, about why such measures based on gross trade flows rather than value-added trade flows have problems. Um, but particularly looking at the, the VAX that Johnson Noguera introduced, which is essentially an inverse measure of backward participation. But we find this measure both to 
um, it, it, it very straightforwardly, um, we, uh, we are interested in both directions of participation. And this, these two measures very straightforwardly are mirror images of each other. And at least looking at the VUX, we didn't find it very easy to come up with a way that uses um, the same concept but just reverse it. And we also use as a robustness check the, um, the foreign value added and the indirect value added, which are value added um, um, which are value added measures that correspond to the same based on the value added share um, in exports on the foreign value added share in exports by the OECD. So we acknowledge that those are crude, but we also show that they have sufficient correlation with, the, with those measures that we would think may be better suited so that it, that it works. And um, again, this is the point that Emily was raising that um, we measure this against the rest of the world. And so this is, first of all, what we, what we get, the pattern of both across time. So we see this increase. We have the financial crisis, the collapse in trade also, um, and then an increase again to after 2009. And so those also seem very correlated. So an obvious question is, as in terms of your econometric work, how are you going to disentangle the two? And we... Um, if they're so correlated, so are they not just going to be collinear? But we use panel data, and we have a bit. We have cross section in the data, and here it seems that they seem to be. I mean, negatively. That's again saying a lot, but ra rather negatively correlated. If there's any correlation, and um, but this is also not something. This is just trying to show that we ha have hopefully sufficient variation in the cross section in order to identify what we're interested in. Um, so this is the relate, but I was talking about the relationship to other measures. So this is the VUX, and we, that we calculate that ourselves from the following exactly the, the measure that uh, Johnson, uh, the methodology that Johnson outlines, showing the correlation. Again, the VUX is an inverse measure of backward participation. Um, and we see that those correlations and the foreign value added from the OCD, which is a, the counterpart for value added share and export, uh, for domestic value added embedded in exports, and these are computed via Leontief measures, and there may be problems with that, but, um, but yeah, we have sufficient correlation between the two to believe that it's not a terrible approximation. And um, so the framework that we are going to be using, again, coming from this, um, from this um, policy site where we started doing this, is the external balances assessment by the IMF. So this is a huge reduced form model of panel regressions trying to control for, for demographics, economic factors, as said. And um, so this is hopefully going to allow us to identify or at least to, to make the argument that this is a rather robust relationship that we are going to be finding. And um, so what, how this is going to work is, again, it's just panel regressions where we're going to embed our measures of GVC participation in a model including variables such as the oil balance. We've seen that Oil exporting countries make up a big share of these imbalances. Output, demographics, capital controls, um, and measures of institutional strength. So also trying to capture this institutional side of the story that we've seen. And um, so these are the results that we obtain getting this. So our baseline sample, this is really the intersection between the countries in the, in the EBA model and the countries in the World Input-Output database. And we... I don't show this here, suppress those, and we also show that including these regressors, it raises the R squared by, I think, about 4%, but this is also something that you can be interested in, but don't need to be. What I want people, or want you to take away from this is that this really seems to, seems, there seems to be something that both backward and forward participation enter positively in our baseline specification with the baseline sample when using the VUX rather than backward participation. Here again, we get the negative value because it's the inverse measure when we use foreign value and added and indirect value added when we use the wire sample when we use fixed effects. So the, the EVA doesn't use fixed effects because it tries to argue that what they really want to get at is what are the drivers and fixed effects and then says have no economic interpretation. But this is, of course, abstracting from econometric concerns that we have with this. So even if you can interpret your coefficients, if they're just wrong, then... So we also do this and all this seems to hold. So this is 
than our starting point. And this is also, so this is the improvement of the fit. So how much better do we do in, and this is the percentage reduction in the residual. So given the size of the residual that I've shown earlier for Germany, this corresponds to roughly a 3% reduction. So we can explain a bit more. For the Netherlands, we do worse. And um, so this is also, and on average, if we plot particularly surplus countries, and if we take the average of how much better do we do, that's, then this really seems to help to at least improve the fit a little bit. Uh, yes, they do. I mean, the, at least the, the fourth column has. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Can oh. you... All your institutional variables drop up, a lot of the stuff. How, many, how long is the panel? Um, 16 years. Oh, so you can come across. Yeah. So you didn't put those regressions on the basis of English and you put some of the other coefficients. Yeah, yeah, no, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. I wanted to... Yeah. Anyway. No, but, yeah, but the others... Um, yeah, maybe I should have just put it in the appendix. <laughs> but they... Um, but the others also don't change in terms of sign or magnitude, so it's, it doesn't crazily, yeah, we, we don't suddenly think that countries with better institutions have a have lower current account, or higher current account. Mm. But wouldn't you expect that uh, you are, what you are actually capturing is just a business cycle, that uh, imports and exports uh, basically vary with the business cycle mm -hmm. and that's what you actually capturing in these uh, correlations um but um to as first of all um, first of all we have um we have controls in that a control for the business cycle in terms of we have gdp growth and we have variables like that and secondly um i'm not so i'm not sure to which degree the current account also is strictly related to the business cycle. At least, I mean, it had to be, right? Maybe this is different. Is it, yeah, yeah, but um, at least we are confident that we have enough controls in here to not do that. So that, th yeah. So the argument would be that this is really just a proxy for the business cycle and yes, that's, that's... Well, at least we've, we've seen yeah, I mean, I, but I think we also see global value chain participation increasing for countries that are during the recession, even during the recession for some countries it kept increasing relative to the rest of the world because for some... But the, but the picture that you just showed us before, you see, yeah, but when you the, had the financial crisis, right. I mean, you had a sharp drop in these value chains. Mm -hmm. And so for the other recessions, you, don't, you might not see that drastically, but it's still there in the data, no? I mean, um, no, I think it's a fair point, and I don't think I have a much better answer than saying that there's hopefully enough controls that would well, fit. So, I mean, if, if you have a country that is, that is running a big deficit, right, mm -hmm. and then you have the trade collapse, that's going, this backward participation is going down, and that's making the deficit less of a deficit. So that would go against what he's finding. I mean, it's, it's right. not obvious that... Take the example of Germany, right? Germany had a big... Uh... Sure. I mean, you can... Yeah, you yeah. can, but you, you yeah. can find... Okay. Uh, You're making a surplus country, but I mean, if you take a deficit country, it goes the other way. It's not that obvious. You can easily explain this. So. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I promise we were going to be very nice. <laughs> uh, wait for it, yeah. <laughs> no, but you should put for the next time the other controls, because some of the yeah. concern of that, if you start seeing all the additional country time very controls like GDP, whatever, you know, you may be reassured. And I think so next time around, put those. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, but so moving from this, so so the hypothesis that we're going to be posting is saying that global value chain participation, seemingly in both directions, seems to positively affect the current account. And um, based on this, we want to take a first step towards understanding this. So really, this is really not meant to say. So this is capturing the story. This is a fully GMM estimated model that will 
tell you that, but we want to see which key ingredients would we need if I were to write down an international real business cycle model to rationalize such patterns. And um, so this is what I've been saying. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be write down a simple open economy model that features trade in final and intermediate goods. And it's going to be featuring shocks, which in <laughs> intuitively... Okay, I need to... Which will, <laughs> which will intuitively work in the right direction. So there's going to be, going to be shocks which will, for, a given, for a country, say, so this shock will say, so not, you suddenly start become much better at using foreign intermediates, and then we're going to be having a rest of the world, which is, which is the rest of the world, and this rest of the world can also experience shocks which will co cause the domestic intermediates going to be in higher demand than the rest of the world. And importantly, those shocks will need to be asymmetric in that, of course, if I had a symmetric two-country model then, and I would use both shocks, then not both will intuitively increase one of those measures, but not both can increase the current account. So for the rest of the world, we're going, the argument would be, so we have Germany. Germany has firms producing really little screws, and, for some, and then there's a shock which causes the rest of the world, these screws to really be in high demand. So the rest of the world suddenly wants German screws for the individual country in the rest of the world. That's a small shock, but for Germany itself, that's a big shock. So that causes higher income relative to the rest of the world. And as opposed to that, if Germany now suddenly becomes really good at, or really wants Italian tires um, to put in that VW, then this will be a small shock, but idiosyncratic to Germany, but also having a similar. And we're going, to be have, um, we're going to have incomplete markets to have a precautionary savings motive so that shocks have real wealth effects. I mean, that's, uh, and we're going also to, we will have to have a home bias in consumption and production because these shocks will affect prices and we want domestic consumers to see a real increase or the, the real wage to increase in order for them to take some of that income and put it in the international market. So say we have two countries, home and foreign, one sector producing a tradable, so it's really a, this plain vanilla. Um, to con so your output is being used both as an, a final good as well as an intermediate good in production. Um, we, have cap we have no capital, we have labor and intermediate inputs. We have an aggregate shock, so we're going to be doing a little quantitative exercise saying, um, so if I calibrate the model and simulate it, can I get this pattern that we had in the data? And if I take out these GVC shocks, these guys, can I still get the pattern? So I uh, wouldn't also be aggregate shocks enough to do this. And um, here we're going also to have an elasticity of substitution be between factors and inputs. And in general, those elasticities, of course, are subject to a lot of debate. We are just going to be taking them from the literature. For example, here there's a, there's a study which just very recently conducted by the Center for um, European Economic Research, which really exactly uses the wired data to estimate this on, a, on the level of aggregation that we need. And um, so intermediate inputs, you source a share, uh, you source a share, or you have the degree of home bias, omega i, and um, for domestically used intermediates, and then you have foreign used intermediates shocked by this tau. And so we explore these, as I've yeah, been saying this, like, just on, yes, and these are not symmetric shocks, so this is the, and um, so the problem of the household, we denote histories by ST, and he's, he has a lifetime expected utility that he wants to maximize. Consumption is over both domestic and foreign goods, and importantly, also here, we have to have a CES aggregate, because if it was Cobb Douglas, then there would be no way to disentangle, if this was all Cobb Douglas, an aggregate shock from an intermediate shock. If I take logs, they would just become the same. So, so we will have to have a CES structure, which I think in front of a trade audience is so bad. And again, we have a home bias in consumption and elasticities of substitution between consumption goods. In general, we're going to be assuming are we going, these are going to be greater than one. And, and we've, seen, um, we've seen a paper saying today that um, production functions seem almost leontif, but we are also positive that we, we look at a, a time frame that's big enough to justify this assumption. And yeah. Um, household supply, labor, um, there's a one-period bond traded in international financial markets. So this is the, and this will coincide with your net foreign asset position if this is the only asset that is being traded in this economy. So in some sense, we're also really simplifying a lot here. We're saying, so there's no decision 
made by our household saying, do I invest in domestic firms, do I invest in foreign assets? So we have no, nothing to say about asset decomposition. Um, the bond is denom denominated, and if you denote w the world labor supply, so this is the variable that relative to my country, I will measure how, how large is I relative to the rest of the world, and it's denominated, as, it's a weighted average of um, consumption good prices, across, and this is just for symmetry displays no role, just to have it as general as possible within. And um, so the budget, so BI bond holdings, BIST will be the bond holdings at the end of period T, and the current account is then just the change in net foreign assets. So it's the change in bond holdings at the end of the period as opposed um, compared to the change uh, to the bonds that I entered the period with. They are in zero net supply in the world. And based on these, we, we, we have everything we need to calibrate or to to both um, calculate these measures of global value chain participation and also to calibrate moments that we can easily read off the wire. So then an equilibrium is markets clear and prices are being taken as given. And now we calibrate the model to the representative country in our sample. So we take the representative country in the, in the EVA and um, ask the following question. So how do macro variables of interest respond to shocks driving forward and backward participation and can the model replicate? So this is really, this is very preliminary. So this is um, a simulation exercise, again, trying to see how important are these home relative to foreign shocks. And so shock processes will be AR1s. And to calibrate this, we, we calibrate the parameters um, in general such that we match. So home bias parameters and labor share, these are being, so that we match the moments that we see in the v -out. We take the elasticities for now from the literature and um, we match the standard deviations of the backward shocks relative to, we, we, we match those such that the relative standard deviations of backward participation and forward participation as well as um, of the current account that those match in our simulations later on. And what we, what we see in the data is that the standard deviation of forward participation of my exported intermediates is more than twice as high as the one of backward participation and then implying that we have to have, have to set a higher higher volatility here to match that. This is why this is asymmetric. And the relative country size, and this is, this is important in, in capturing those, those wealth effects, but the asymmetry of these shocks. And um, we... The, raw, the persistent parameter, where do you get it from? The oh, shock persistent? Oh, this is, the, this is used to... Um, so we really we set it the same for now across, um, across those processes to match um, the, the persistence of output. In the, and um, to, to really also, because I think at least if you say, so what can we learn from this model? I think if anything we can learn, so for some reason we need to, in order to get this mechanism in such a model, we will have to have processes where for some reason the, the forward part, the shocks affecting forward participation have higher levels of standard deviation. And there can be maybe network structure stuff around that that, <laughs> that could capture. So, but... So focusing on these for now. But yeah, of course, and again, this is not, we haven't put this thing and run a GMM on the data series. So, yeah. But that, that's key, no? I mean, yeah. row is one that you're going to get very different answers. Yeah, 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 no, but, but I think that's, so I, I agree, but I think that's in some sense cl clear a priori that it, the story won't work if row was one. If these shocks weren't temporary, then the whole story in the first place. So I think this we, I mean, of course, you, eventually you would want to estimate it. I mean, it would be not so nice if I could stand here right now and tell you I, I've run a GMM and MLE something and it tells me it's not, it can't be one to match the data. But for now, just to illustrate how this works for you. Yeah, I mean, I was wondering whether, I mean, because you also have, so you have these shocks and then there's an adjustment on wages. So mm -hmm. I wonder whether if you had sort of a slow adjustment, there'd be a, that yeah. the initial shock yeah. would be much higher than after... A while wages are going to readjust and yeah if, if so yeah if, if wages were sticky in some way uh, yeah also some of, yeah you wouldn't have the you would have a weaker response in the relative wealth because um, so we compute um, the, this is the impulse response to a domestic shock and and we and we see that the the so what happens here is that oh no, I think to illustrate that it's better to look at the foreign shock so here terms of trade are really just the price of your home good so if wages were not to adjust immediately, then the real wage 
if we normalize the foreign goods price and we have to, and the home goods price increases, then th this couldn't happen. Yeah, exactly. So this is also assuming price flexibility, quite crucial. Yeah, and um, so these are the impulse responses. And again, maybe in the interest of so uh, interest of time. So we see for the domestic shock, the current account increases, backward participation increases more than forward participation. So we do have this co-movement and similarly for the foreign shock. So we see very little response. In the, and, but of course, this is now Cetra's parable saying, I just shock one of these and in some way we've written the model in a way that we expected that. And so and one exercise that I do here is that I, so I take this model and I, I simulate, or we simulate it. Um, so we run 40 simulations of the two country models if we perturb it and we use third order approximation methods in order to capture this precautionary savings motive as well as to make bond holdings non-stationary. So that's a concern in these almost small open economy models that your bond holdings can just implode and to avoid having to put adjustment costs or, or something ad hoc like this. And, um, and the way this works is that we simulate, so I simulate the model 40 times for two countries but I hold the rest of the world constant so that I have 40 countries that face the same rest of the world. And for each simulation, I compute my measures, I, the current account, and um, drop the rest of the world, and then I have a panel, a simulated panel with 40 countries, and then I can run regressions on that. And I do this uh, 10 times, and then take averages, and so that the rest of the world also changes 10 times, that it's not just a one. And when I do this, then, so these are the relative, okay, this, so these are the moments that I matched with the standard deviation, and of course, if I have GVC shocks, I do match them because I, I, that's what I'm aiming for. These are the estimates that I get with GVC shocks. So I, it seems to, that even in the presence of aggregate shocks, those shocks seem, still seem to matter. So there's going, in here there's aggregate shocks as well as these GVC shocks. And this still seems to matter. And if I drop the GVC shocks, so I have only aggregate shocks, then I see in my, da in my simulated data, I see no nothing at all. But of course, this is, again, very much dependent on calibration, on stickiness assumptions. And yeah, so that's how far as we got. And um, yeah, so to conclude, so we um, connected two major developments in a really macro, probably in a very simplistic way, but try to get a first punch at how can we start thinking about it and what kind of structure would I want in a model to get this. from uh, the more macro Ali, Harald <laughs> I know you have to ask something I can tell I can tell it's written on your face no? no you <laughs> no really. and Manu I'm sure you have a question <laughs> no please please no. <laughs> a Minnesota guy like you <laughs> if not I guess so let me let me look. So, are we? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I can't believe that. The chair is missing. So, let's. Uh,